Baruch Hashem, Yahweh. Thank you, Brother John. Yaakov, James chapter 5. James chapter 5. We are blessed. Let's dig right into this, our last chapter. Deep work, though. Yaakov, the brother of Yahusha. Come now, you rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are tarnished. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is tarnished, and their, tr- their rust shall be a witness against you, and that shall eat your flesh as it was fire. You have stored up treasure together for the yamin achorim, for the last days. So what we see here is the opening opening words here of Yaakov, James, the brother of Yahusha, challenging these prosperous Sadducees and the chief priests at the time because they were actually oppressing the followers of the Malkit Zedek. You see, their miseries, we can see from chapter 5, verse 1 through verse 3 here, their miseries will soon be returned upon their heads because the anvil of the destruction of the temple in 70 of the common era through Rome was going to come upon them. So in fact, whatever riches they were storing up, they were storing up for their own destruction that they would actually be stored up for the Romans. And we can see that from the Arch of Titus. So all the wealth that they were storing up, it wasn't going to end up in their hands. It was going to end up in the hands of the Romans carrying back the treasures back to Rome. This was the first installment of Yahweh's general judgment. The first installment of Yahweh's general judgment. And his judgment is on humanity. And that judgment brought what? The end of the then known Jewish world, did it not? That judgment that happened in 70 of the common era brought an end to the then known Jewish world. And we've never seen it again. Not like that. So what makes us think that we are any different? What makes us think that we won't get the final installment on this judgment in the Western world, and it will be the end of the then known Western world. And I believe that you and I are witnessing that if we've got the eyes to see. Look to Europe. We had the Brexit vote, which was surprising. And now, the other European countries, they're just waiting to leave. I think that you are starting to see this final installment of this judgment. Remember we spoke about the the cycle. The first cycle was at Kadesh Barnea. The second cycle is the judgment of 70 of the common era. And then the third cycle is for the Yamin Achorim, the last days. And it speaks of their tarnishing gold and their tarnishing silver through non-use will actually function as an adversarial witness against them because it demonstrated their failure to use their resources to the benefit of others. Now, history records that, in fact, this was true. And you can see that in the Arch of Titus, verse 4. Behold, the wages of the laborers who have reaped your fields, that you hold back by fraud. And the cries of those who have reaped have entered into the ears of the master Yahuwah Zevot, Lord of the Sabaoth, Sabaoth, or in the Hebrew, Adonai Zevoth. It means the master of legions, and it's in military and legal splendor because he is always ruling. Yet at times, he directly intervenes to to secure his own victory and ensure salvation for his zadiks, his righteous servants, his righteous saints. It's a fabulous term. Now look at verse 5. You have lived in pleasure on the earth. You have been in luxury, and you have nourished your own levenot, your own hearts. 
as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the Zadik one, the righteous one, and he does not resist you. You see, the rich, they've gorged themselves at the expense of the poor, and they are depicted right here as food for the foul and beasties at the end time, monstrous, eschatological feast of judgment that's coming. And that's what's going to happen. And there's three areas in which the rich are found guilty. Number one, they're profiteers. They're defrauding their day laborers. And we, we see that written in the Torah that you can't do that. By Ikra, Leviticus 19, verse 13. Deuteronomy 24, verse 14. Jeremiah speaks of it in the 22nd chapter in the 13th verse. And Malachi charges them in the 3rd chapter in the 5th verse. These are profiteers. They're defrauding the day laborers. These laborers, they lived literally from hand to mouth. That they depended upon getting paid that very day. It was their very sustenance. And the hire itself cries out. The capital itself, it's interesting, if you look at it, the capital itself begins crying out for vengeance. And we know, those of us that study the scripture, that trees can speak out, stones can speak out, blood has a voice, does it not? You see, blood, stones, trees, they all have a voice. And their cries reach, I love this term, the master Sabaoth. The master Sabaoth. It's the cry of the oppressed. The cry of the oppressed to Yahuwah. Sabaoth. This is the only place used by a writer himself in the whole of the Brit Hadashah where you find this term Sabaoth. It means hosts. And it's a very Jewish phrase. And now we know this is a Jewish author communicating to a very Jewish audience. In Romans 9, verse 29, you do find Sabaoth, but the writer didn't put it him himself. He's actually quote eight, quoting excuse me, Isaiah, Yeshayahu, chapter 1, verse 9. So that's Sabaoth. The second cause of these rich oppressors is they're living a luxurious life at the expense of the poor. There's three charges for this. Number one, you have lived in pleasure on the earth and you have been in luxury. So their self-indulgence has fattened them up. They're just fattened calves, ready for the day of slaughter. They don't realize that, but they've just fattened themselves up like calves in a stock, ready for the slaughter of 70 of the common era. Their lives have been lived in the very now. That's all they're thinking about, the now. They're not thinking about the eschatological future. Do we live in a society like that? I just got back from Washington, D.C. You were down where? Nashville. And I mean, you're surrounded, and they're just living in the now, chasing after the cara. Just ch- that's it. They're obsessed with it. That's it. And, and, and it's just amazing to me. There is no light. And then the light that you bring in, it causes this tension because there's so much darkness. Because all they're concerned about is the now and the wealth. The prospect of wealth. The prospect of wealth. And that's it. And I'm surrounded with these people. They're 60, 75 years old, chasing the carrot. And I'm looking and I'm like, give it up. I mean, is, is that what this is about? But it is to them. Nothing. There's nothing. There's no light. And the light that you bring in causes that vexing in the darkness. But these people, what they have done at the time of the writing here, their lives have been lived in the now without any thought of the eschatological future. Myself, I think of that all the time because that is what guides my very steps. The consequences of everything that I do, I know, will have ramifications in the future before Yahuwah. Everything, everything, every thought, everything that comes out of my mouth. It's so much different than the world. The second thing, they've been in luxury. It's the concept of wastefulness to their own self-indulgence. And the third thing, you have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You see, their inner man 
has become fattened just as their outer man has become blubbery, softened until they're even unable to fight the fight. And when the Russians came in after the Second World War and they marched people off to the gulags, because so many had not lived in preparation for the times that they were in, they dropped by the wayside. So we do have a responsibility to prepare, not only in our hearts, but in our outer man too, for this eschatological future. And the third area where the rich are found guilty is this, violence. You have condemned and killed the Zadik one. Now, this is a phrase that people have had trouble with over the centuries, over the millennia, in fact. Well, wh who is the Zadik one? What is the Zadik one? You have condemned and killed the righteous one, the Zadik one. This is talking about judicial murder. The righteous one can be taken in any one of these two ways. Number one, it could refer to Mashiach, could it not? It could refer to Messiah. And if, if it's used in a singular fashion, the rich religious rulers killed Yahushua, and we know he didn't resist them. Now, that's recorded to us in Acts 3.15, Acts 7.52, Acts 9, 17, and finally Acts chapter 22, verse 14. We find this zadik, or in the Greek, dikaios, dikaios. So that interpretation definitely does hold up. And if this is the case, then we actually find within this text some high Christology, which has been missing. Because it's been a very layman letter to the people, or a homily, I should say, to the people. But if this is the case, if it's referring to Messiah, then we've got some high Christology that's just been slipped in here for the first time, which is very interesting to me, because that would build upon the Yom Yahweh or the Day of Yahweh traditions that were very prevalent at the time of this writing. So if that is the case, then they are building, Yaakov is bringing in high Christology and building upon the day of Yahuwah, the Yom Yahuwah traditions that were very familiar within the communi community and circulating during the first century. Now, the second interpretation is the righteous one here is talking about a righteous class of peoples. You, the believers the saints, or the saints, the Kiddushim, at the time of the writing. The rich have oppressed the followers of Yahushua, and they haven't resisted this persecution. Because they can't, right? They can't. They don't have the resources. They don't have the resources, and they're helpless in the face of these cruel, religious, tyrannical rulers. So there's two ways that we can see and look at that as far as you have condemned and killed the Zadik one. And for these three sins, the rich will fall under the heavy anvil of the 70 of the common era judgment. Look at verse 7. Be patient, therefore, Israelite brothers, to the coming, in the Greek, the parousia, the coming of the master the Greek word here is kurios, the master kurios Yahuwah. So there's two Greek words that I want to take back, one in particular, kurios, to the Septuagint, because we'll go to the Torah, the law of first mention. Because wherever this is first mentioned is going to give us its usage, and the context is going to come forward, and it's very, very telling. Be patient, therefore, Israelite brothers, to the coming parousia of the master or curious Yahuwah. Behold, the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has great patience for it until it receives the earthly and the latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your leaven oat, your hearts, for the coming parousia of the master draws near. Amen. So Yaakov has a strong sense of what? The imminence. He has this strong sense of imminence. The parousia, the coming. Yaakov believes that Yahushua isn't here, as in drawn near. 
He's drawn near the righteous assembly. He believes that Yahushua is drawn near the righteous assembly. But he also believes that Yahushua could return at any time. And so he could also be what? Temporarily near as well. You see, regardless, we do know that the parousia or the drawing near is the very next event in the salvation historical timetable, isn't it? That is the very next event on the salvation historical timetable. So scripturally, in fact, the last days have been occurring since the first century. You can find that from our study of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Yaakov makes the unconscious impatience of the first century saints the basis for this whole exhortation to be consciously patient. And then we come to this other word, curious Yahuwah, the master curious Yahuwah. And where is this word first appear in the whole of the scriptures? You'd have to go back into the Septuagint and the Torah of first mention. Bereshit, Genesis chapter 15, verse 8. The coming of the curious Adonai Yahuwah at the Malkitzedic covenant of the pieces. You see, I'm not making this stuff up. And it, it, it is everywhere. The curious, the first mention of the curious in the whole of the scriptures is at the Malkitzedic flaying open covenant of the pieces because curious does what? What is Yaakov emphasizing here? Who's the half brother of Yahusha, the Malkitzedic? He's emphasizing that Yahusha is the fulfiller of the death penalty, that he has brought forth the salvation and deliverance to the righteous community whilst bringing judgment on the oppressors. That's the emphasis. This is amazing. He is the one that is truly brought forth the covenant that is enabling them to find salvation and deliverance from the rich oppressors that are now upon them. It's a Malkitzedic Kohen Haggadol. Now we find this word husbandman or farmer, Georgios in the Greek. It's talking about a tenant farmer who has to exercise patience after planting. I mean, their whole livelihood was agricultural. So they would plant this seed and then they would be like, well, hope we can survive, right? And now everything is in their hands? No. Everything, once they've done their job and planting the seed, is in the hands of the master Yahweh. It's out of their control. Their whole livelihood, their whole sustenance. They look at their children and they're going, I wonder if they're going to be able to get through the next winter. This is what the text is communicating. And when we're going down to Safeway or Fred Meyer, hopefully you're not going to Target anymore, um, you kind of lose what we're talking about here, right? But the tenant farmer, he had to exercise patience after planting. He was at the mercy of external forces. It was beyond his control. All the time, he faced fear. He was totally uncertain. Was there going to be a drought? Maybe there was going to be a swarm of locusts. Pestilence was going to come forth and ruin his whole crop. And so too with us. The spiritual harvest, the spiritual harvest on these last days, it is totally dependent upon what? Yahuwah's intervention. This spiritual harvest in these last days is totally dependent upon Yahuwah's intervention. And we have to be patient. We plant the word. We go out and do the work. But you can't make your family members believe. You can't make them believe. And I know I'm a salty character, but you silencing these little phrases that you don't like that I say isn't going to draw your family either because it's not me. It's Yahuwah. And we have had a lot of people say, hey, let's change this, change that, and not use this. And that's all well and good, but it's not going to draw the family members. 
Your family member didn't come to the message because Matthew used the institutionalized church. They didn't come to the message because their heart was hardened and it was not fertile ground. That's the truth. That's the truth. But we have to be patient because now you pray more for them. You pray more for them that somebody else would come in and speak that message. And finally, their heart would be open to the truth. You see, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about us being patient on the external forces of Yahuwah working in the internal heart of man, right? Let's get a reality check because it's all very easy to look at the carnal, look at the, the messenger or whatnot, but, you know, don't kill the messenger. <laughs> all right? Crying out loud. Lechaim to that one. <laughs> but they would have to truly maintain an attitude of thankful expectancy. And that's what Yahweh was trying to communicate with us. We need to maintain an attitude of thankful expectancy until we too receive the early and latter rains, right? Look at verse 8. Establish your lev, your heart. In the Greek, it's sterizo. The Hebrew is nathan, nathan. It means Yahweh will always strengthen whatever's in your heart. What happened to Pharaoh? Whatever was in Pharaoh's heart, Yahweh just strengthened it. And Yahweh gives us over to our own desires. If you're a whoremonger and that's in your heart, then guess what? He'll just strengthen that. And you'll go down and down and down and down, more into degradation and de deprivation. Whatever is in our heart, Yahweh will strengthen. So we need to get our heart right by purification in the Word and the washing of the word, and Yahuwah will strengthen that. And I have to confess my sins to you right now. I was truly convicted. I've been watching too much news. And you know what that's like? It's kind of like pornography. Because by watching too much news, that's not my reality. I am therefore living in somebody else's reality. And that's what pornography is. I mean, bad stuff happened in Istanbul. But that's not my reality. And if I focus on that, then my reality where I'm surrounded by holy brethren that are seeking Yahuwah, a family that's... Then that has actually come into my heart, poisoned and corrupted my heart, and it's affected my reality. So I'm on a news fast. So you're not going to get the local news or the international. You're going to have to tell me. Because I just realized that. I'm like, hang on a minute. Why am I feeling the way I'm feeling? Well, garbage in, garbage out. There's a lot of bad stuff happening in the world. And that's not my reality. That is not my reality. I am going to focus on my reality and I'm done. So that's something that I really, really had shown to me this week. Lay off the news. Lay off the news. It is not your reality, Matthew. Focus on what is really happening around you, and you'll start to feel what I want you to experience right now with your family, with the community. And I think that's something, an admonishment for us all. Interesting, isn't it, though? The Greek word here... Yahweh will always there, sterizo or Nathan, he will strengthen whatever's in your heart, just like he did with Pharaoh. We need to develop that inner stability, and that's what this news fast is for me. It's developing that inner stability rather, being, rather than being shaken by the troubles, which aren't even my reality, right? Verse 9, grumble not one against another, Israelite brothers, lest you be condemned. Behold, the shofet, the judge stands before the door. We have to be careful when we approach doors. That's what this verse is teaching us. You need to be careful when you approach doors because you're either going to approach doors of judgment 
in that judgment hall and feast of the fowl and the beasties, or you're going to approach the door of the Malkitzedic covenant and you will be face to face with the Malkitzedic himself. Revelation 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, now listen to this. In the whole context of what we've been studying about the Malkit Zedek, remember, remember everything that we've spoken. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and have a covenant-confirming meal. That's the dine, the sup with him. And then Revelation 19, verse 7, is the marriage. And verse 9 is the marriage supper of the Lamb, the sup or covenant-confirming meal. Because you heeded the covenant, the calling from the voice from the mountain, Revelation 3.20, come in and sup, come in. This is the acceptance. Remember, there's a proposal, an acceptance, a covenant-confirming meal, blood ratification, and a covenant-confirming meal. That these are the four things that we always see, the fifth always attaching back to Abraham. We have a proposal, acceptance, blood ratification, and a covenant-confirming meal. And the kurios attaches us all the way back to the covenant between the pieces, the covenant of Abraham. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and have a covenant confirming meal, dine, sup with him. Revelation 19.7 is the marriage. Revelation 19.9 is the marriage supper of the Lamb, the sup or covenant confirming meal. Because they heeded the covenant, they heeded the call, the voice from the mountain. Come in. Revelation 3.20, that is the acceptance, the sup, the covenant confirming meal, and the voice, of course, connects us back to that voice in Exodus 19, verse 5. My, he, my sheep, they hear my voice. Yes. Now, the voice, this is a dedicated phrase of the covenant, 1 Peter 2.9, called by a voice, right? This is all tying us back to Yaakov's brother, the Malkit Zedek Kohen Haggadah. Verse 10. Take, my Israelite brothers, the Nevim, look at the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Master Yahuwah as our example of suffering. They're our example of affliction. They are our example of patience. Behold, we count them blessed who endure. We have heard of the patience of Iov, Job, and have seen the purpose of the Master Yahuwah, that the Master Yahuwah is full of pity and full of tender rachamin, mercy. You see, even though Job complained, he exercised patience. He never complained to the point of apostasy, did he? He exercised patience. He remained loyal in the midst of advers adversity from the adversary. Job's patience was the goal of Job's suffering. And verse 12, Above all things, my Israelite brothers, swear not, neither by the Shamaim, the heavens, neither by the Olam, the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and your no be no, lest you fall into condemnation. And this is where I confess and repent. I've taught for many, many years, and I'm guilty of both of the things that I'm about to expose, because both of them are wrong. Oaths are forbidden. Right here, we can see the oaths are forbidden. And there's no obvious exceptions that are indicated within the text, right? Yet, when I taught in the church, I had no problem when Yahushua 
says in the Sermon on the Mount, that oaths are forbidden. So I taught, yeah, yeah, oaths are forbidden. Of course. Well, anyway, he nailed the law to the tree. I even have a teaching that I did 15 years ago where I even, it's on tape, CD, I think. No, actually, it may be tape, where I actually stood before a congregation and I said, well, it's not like we are supposed to keep the Ten Commandments. We can't keep them. I said that once. So I also taught in the church that Yahushua abolished oaths because he abolished the Torah and nailed it to the tree. And many of us have come out of that teaching. But then I've also sinned and erred, and this is my confession to you. And why am I doing it? Because we'll find later on in this text, it does say that we're to confess our sins publicly. So, hey, the buck stops here. Um, And it's hard to do that. You know, it's easy to sit in front of a bookshelf and look good, but it's a lot harder to stand before people and just say, you know, I've made mistakes. These are the mistakes I've made. I confess them to you. And now we're going to correct the course and look deeper. Because I also ran headlong into the messianic movement and tried to grab hold of every obscure Aramaic text I could find to justify why Yahushua was not abolishing oaths at the Sermon of the Mount. Because if he did change one Torah commandment, then he would not be the Messiah. In fact, he'd be the anti-Messiah, right? Who's heard that in the Hebrew roots community? He can't change one of the Torah commandments, otherwise he wouldn't in fact be the Messiah. So then you run headlong into all these obscure Aramaic texts that you can never pin down. I'm sorry, You can never pin them down to exactly where they came from and, you know, they've been copied. And you find these an obscure Aramaic text to justify, well, actually, he didn't say that at the Sermon on the Mount. He said this. I've also been guilty of that. All that to say this. Above all things, my Israelite brothers, swear not neither by the Shamayim, neither by the Olam, neither by any other oath, let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into condemnation. And no obscure text is going to alter what Matthew 5 verse 33 says. Even though I read, rushed headlong into that in the Hebrew Roots movement. There's two opposing views that I've taught, and they're both wrong. And I confess that before you today. The two opposing views are this. This is what I taught at Calvary Chapel. I saw no problem, and I offered no explanation to Yahushua in Matthew 5, verse 33, and his brother here in verse 12, abolishing oath-taking. I saw no problem with that, right? Well, of course he abolished oath-taking because even though it was allowed in the Torah, he abolished oath-taking because that thinking was in line, of course, with, well, the law has been nailed to the cross theology, right? So I saw no problem in that theology. What do you expect? But also I'm guilty of this. The second one is this. The Messianic movement rushes headlong to defend the Torah position of oath-taking and trips over itself as it rustles up all these obscure Aramaic translations and Greek word plays to make Yahushua's words and James's words say something that they simply don't say. Both views miss the Malkit-Zedek covenantal harmony. And this is the truth. Because there is this Malkit-Zedek harmony that lies beneath the surface that we've all missed. And let me be clear. That's why I'm up here confessing and repenting and asking for all of your forgiveness. Because I've been guilty of both one and two. 
But to grasp the truth, we must be able to see that Yaakov here is aligning himself with some of the most radical and counter-order wisdom of Yahusha. You see, Yahusha's covenantal speech and his ethics is what we're talking about here. And what do I mean? Yahusha, listen, he is, I'll go out on a limb here, he is overruling Leviticus 19.12. Yahusha is overruling Leviticus 19.12. And Yaakov is aware of it, and he's reinforcing his words right here. Yahusha overruled Leviticus 19.12 in Matthew 5, verse 33. And Yaakov is aware of it, and here in verse 12, he's reinforcing that overrulement. And you're like, well, that can't be so. He can't do that. I know this because I've said this very thing. He can't do that. He can't do away with one Torah commandment. Otherwise, he'd be the anti-Messiah. I've said these very things. But I've missed what's going on under the surface. I've missed the most radical counter-order wisdom of Yahusha. His covenantal speech ethics. That's what I missed. Oaths. This is the kicker. Oaths were fundamental. We all know this. They were fundamental to ancient covenant treaty making. But by the time of the Levitical ruling of Leviticus 19 verse 12, Israel had already broken the book of the covenant treaty with Yahweh, had they not? It was already broken. By Leviticus 19.12, the book of the covenant treaty had already been broken. So Leviticus 19.12 is the added book of the law ordinance, the schoolmaster. It is not part of the fidelity Malkitzedic covenant. You see, the book of the covenant Torah oath treaty of Genesis 15, which the curious in our text attaches us right back to, had been broken along with all of its ordinances and all of its promises. Yahweh can't break the original Genesis 12 oath, can he though? Because that was unconditional. He doesn't break the Psalm 110 oath to his Malkitzedic, does he? But Leviticus 19.12's requirements are not a book of the covenant ordinance. They're for a fallen, guilty, and adulterous nation that is under the book of the law. Yahusha and Yaakov testify to the eschatological death penalty payment, breaking in and cutting a new book of the covenant here, completely different from the added, not agreed to book of the law, in that it's written on hearts which will require no additional oaths to attest to it, because it's truths are already attached back to the Malkit Zedek by the everlasting oath of Genesis 12, Psalm 110, Hebrews 6.16, and Hebrews 7.20. That oath always stood. So Yahusha, in this absolutely amazing thing, is overriding Leviticus 19.12 because he's already enabling us through his death penalty position of Genesis 15 to attach back to the ever-standing oath that was never taken away forever of Genesis 12, Yahuwah's oath there. So the question is, are Yahusha and Yaakov, his half-brother here, abolishing oaths? Yes. And this is where the calls come out. False prophet! How can he say such things? Steady on. Let me finish. He is abolishing the Torah of oaths 
in Leviticus 19.12. Is he abolishing the Torah? No. They're redirecting us back to the higher Torah, the oath of Genesis 12. Fidelity Torah. This is harmony. This is harmonizing all of those apparent contradictions that aren't contradictions in the Scripture. And you don't have to go wrestling up obscure texts and do Greek word plays to try and make it make sense. This is truly the narrow road. Does that make sense? There's a lot of information to think about, but ultimately... Yahusha and Yaakov are abolishing the oath of Leviticus 19.12 because that was a book of the law ordinance to a nation that had already broken the covenant and then he is now redirecting us back through his death penalty position to Genesis 12, the everlasting oath that Yahuwah made to Abraham. Now let's look at verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him take tefillah. Let him make, excuse me, prayer, tefillah. Is any in a tov mood, a good mood? Let him sing from the tehillim. Let him sing from the psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the zachin, the elders of the congregation, and let them make tefillah over him, anointing him with oil in the name of Yahuwah. And the tefillah, the prayers of the faith of the saints shall save the sick, and Yahweh shall raise him up, and he who has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. You see, both Yaakov and Hebrews show right here the primitive vision of the leadership structure of the believing community. It wasn't this high church, ecclesiastical, Pauline Christianity that we've developed over these centuries, but this was a very primitive vision that they had of the structure of the congregation at the writing of Yaakov. We find this servant leader. That's what Yaakov was. He was a servant leader, very much in ascendancy due to his rhetoric and reason in the word, and he was pointing the confrere, his colleagues, the presbyterus, the zakin, working in their very giftings, and he was calling to the attending, to the priesthood, which was very far-reaching. He talks about conduct in prayer, because truly, as we get into this section, our faith is tested by resorting to prayer in all circumstances. And there's three points here to prayer. Number one, suffering. Let him pray. Present tense. That means continually, continually. You see, prayer isn't always going to remove the problem. How many of us have prayed and the problem is still there? You see, prayer isn't designed necessarily to remove the problem. But it's a means of appropriating, a means of appropriating the grace needed to endure the problem, to endure the suffering, as, a, as well as obtaining the wisdom to sustain myself through the trials. We have to understand the purpose of prayer. Number two, joy. If you're joyful, the appropriate response then is to sing praises. To sing praises. And number three, sickness. means without strength. Then let him call for the shamashim, the elders of the assembly. You see, the sick are the ones who are to initiate the call. The sick need to initiate the call. You must ask yourself, why is Yaakov right here using this Greek word, alpheo, not the Greek word charisma. Because he could have used the Greek word charisma, but he's not using this Greek word charisma. He's using the Greek word alpheo. Now, of course, this jumped out of me when I was studying this. I mean, charisma is the common word that you would use right here. But he doesn't use it. So I go back into the Septuagint, because that's where I'm going to go. And I'm going to wonder, why, why didn't he not use charisma? That was so common in the term, in the, in the usage right there. But he doesn't. It doesn't make sense. He's using this Greek word alpheo. Well, alpheo 
is the Septuagintal language of the anointing of the priest. And Yaakov attributes it to the believers who follow the high priest. Why would he use this word if we're not a kingdom of priests and a holy nation? He deliberately chooses not to use the Greek word charisma, but this Greek word which directly goes back to the priest's anointing if we're not priests who are supposed to go out anointing the sick. And that means with olive oil. Somebody said that somebody was anointing with Crisco. It wasn't in here, but somewhere. No, it's not Crisco or butter, but it's olive oil. Because <laughs> it's true. Somebody came up to me afterwards and I think asked me if that was okay. I'm like, no. Get that stuff away from me. Yeah, no lard either. But anointing oil, it's medicinal. If it's olive oil, it's medicinal. It can be. But it's also pastoral. It's sacramental. But it's also symbolic. It has this fourfold function. It's the faith of the Kohanim, the priests, not the faith of the sick one that reaches the high priest, the Kohen Hagadol, as he specifically, not the oil or the Kohanim that performs the healing as the rightful Kohen Hagadol, high priest. And then we find in verse 16, confess your faults one to another and make tefillah, prayer for one another, that you may be healed, the effectual Fervent tefillot, prayers of a Zadig man, is powerful, accompanying much. And we're not talking extreme unction here, like the Catholicos. Now, that's going to upset some people. We're not. We're not talking about extreme unction here, right? Who's going to go into my little closet? Calvin said this. I'm amazed at the folly of the Baptists. Or is it just wickedness? Who attempt to extract their whispering confessional from this proof. And that's where they did get the confessional from this text right here. The Baptists. You see, forgiveness of sins brings healing. It truly does. So, we need to confess our sins. I mean, I once had somebody come to me. Finally, after they committed adultery on their wife, and say, well, I'm just, I just, I, I confess my sins to the Lord, to Yahweh, and it just hasn't been going well for me. And I'm like, am I the first person that you've told this to? Yes. Well, how long ago did it happen? Or was it was, you know, a couple months back. Do you tell your wife? No. It, it doesn't go like that. You need to confess your sins publicly. And now we're going round to your home and you're going to tell your wife. <laughs> what? Yeah. yeah. Tamara. And off we go. It's not this like, oh yeah, uh-huh. No, you better be confessing publicly and then you confess to Yahuwah. You see, that's what we're missing, many of us. It's not this private little thing. I do some sinning and then I go and, you know, just me and Yahuwah. No, because the true healing is going to happen when you publicly confess your sins. That's why I'm getting so much healing teaching, because I get to confess to you the mistakes and the sins that I've made. But I'm supposed to be leading by example, but we do need to do that, because that is what brings the healing. Yes, amen. It truly does. It truly does. Confess your sins. You'll not only feel better, you'll get some healing, and you'll get that deliverance, that long crave for deliverance that you need. In the Greek here, it's exomologio paratomo, confess your sins. And it means 
a full, open confession. The sinner has to agree. This is the key. And we're not very good at this in our culture. But the sinner has to agree to call sin what Yahweh calls it. If Yahweh calls it na'af, then you call it na'af, adultery. If Yahweh calls it na'af, adultery, then you call it adultery. If Yahweh calls it gala nida, incest, then you call it incest. We can't try and excuse it using human logic and reason. If Yahweh calls it rakil, scandal mongering, don't try and excuse it and say, well, I was just relaying information. No. Unless you align yourself with what Yahweh calls it, you will get no healing in your families and you will get no deliverance in your families. If he calls it that, you need to align yourself and call it that too. And then finally you'll get the healing. But if you want to just sweep it to the side and play happy families, you won't get the deliverance. You cannot manipulate Yahweh privately in some confessional. You just can't do it. You have to call it what he calls it. You have to. That's the only way you get the deliverance. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. I've had so many times in my life where I have not been willing to call it what Yahweh called it. And I'm so blessed that I have a wife who does not let me get away with anything and has said, has mourned sometimes. and said, you just, you just don't get it, do you, Matthew? I'm like, what? She's like, you will never get deliverance unless you just kill it. And, and then I'm just heartstruck, and I'm like, right. You have got to call it what Yahweh calls it, and then you get the deliverance. That's truly aligning. But our logical reason and thinking is so influenced by this world that we live in, yeah which is all built upon attacking the family, breaking down families, ruining marriages, ruining marriage. I mean, a year ago, the White House was in technicolor, pride. And now, in Oregon, we just voted that you could be what? You don't have to be male. You don't have to be female. You can be, what's the other one? Binary. Right? <laughs> Wrong! But this is, this is just in a year. Crazy stuff. The Zadig's prayer is strong because it's the power of an energetic prayer and a community is healed when in trust and vulnerability it's able to pray and confess its sins together. Let's look at verse 17 now. It gives us some examples going to Eliyahu, Elijah. Eliyahu was a man subject to many emotions as we are. And he made tefillah prayer earnestly that it would not rain. And it rained not on the earth for three years and six months. And he made tefillah prayer again. And the shamayim, the heavens gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. You see, verse 17 emphasizes Elijah's humanity. He prayed earnestly. It literally means he prayed with prayer. That's what he did. He prayed with prayer. 1 Kings 17.1, 1 Kings 18.1. And now, some would say there's a conflict in those texts of six months, but there actually isn't a conflict because if you look at those texts, Eliyahu's time in Zarephath is only what's being counted, not the six months prior to his arrival. Luke 4.25 attests to that, bringing perfect harmony between those three texts. If some of you may have caught that, I did. Um, but at first I was like, what's this six-month discrepancy? But then actually when you get a little further in, you can see that Eliyahu's time in Zarephath is only what's being counted, not the six months prior to his arrival. So I love it when at first there seems to be a discrepancy in the scriptures, but then you dig in and you dig in and you find perfect. It's harmonized. But that's the thing. People don't want to spend the time or they're afraid when they come across the discrepancies that they just kind of like pretend they're not there. But they are there 
But they're there for a reason, so that we'll go deeper with him. And that's, that's the living word. It's alive. It's alive so that we'll go deeper with him. And that's a walk. So as I've confessed to you the mistakes that I've made, all in all, it's all for Yahweh's glory because it's enabled me to go deeper and deeper and deeper because I'm tenacious like a greyhound and I just don't give up. I just keep on going. You see, the purpose of prayer, the purpose of the prayer of the righteous will accomplish great things even when you're surrounded by enemies, even when you're surrounded in this world that we're surrounded with, with idolaters. I mean, they doubt our faith, don't they? All the time. You see, verse um, 9, chapter 5, verse 9, is an exhortation against grumbling, and it builds upon the earlier judge, not lest you be judged. Chapter 5, verse 12 is an exhortation about oaths, and it builds upon the previous discussion on taming the tongue. So it's all building. Chapter 5, verse 19, rescuing the wayward believer, builds upon warnings against friendships with the world in James chapter 4. Eliyahu is the example to us of effective prayer. Job is the example to us of patience and perseverance. Suffering should not retaliate upon oppressive persons. If you're suffering, we're not supposed to retaliate upon those that would oppress us. And endurance, endurance doesn't succumb under oppressive things. This is what's being communicated. Verse 19. Give Israelite brothers, if any of you does stray from the emet, the truth, and one of you helps him make teshuvah, repentance, let him know that he who turns the sinner from the error of his derek, his way, shall save a being from death and shall cover a multitude of sins. Amen. We need to rescue the backslider. You see, a moral failure as well as a doctrinal failure will lead to moral failure. Teshuva means to turn around and embrace Yahweh and start the right direction, walking in his ways. Halakha. We need to turn around. We need to set his feet back in the Torah direction. If one who's strayed returns to the truth, there'll be results. And these results are, number one, he shall save his soul from death. This speaks of physical death. Sometimes Yahweh will discipline people by physical death. They'll just take them out. Take them out. I think we've all seen that. I know I have. Number two, and he shall cover a multitude of sins. Now, this doesn't mean that you sweep repentant sins under the carpet. That's not what it's talking about. It means that the repentant sinner has secured forgiveness. The Hebrew word here is kasar. The Greek word here is kalupto. Kalupto. You see the cloud by day and the fire by night in the wilderness. That was in the Hebrew the kasar or the Greek the kalupto. It's what covered Israel. It's what covered Israel until the true kasar, the true kalupto, could come and pay the death penalty position and connect them back to Genesis chapter 12. Now, as we close, we have to ask these few things in reflection of what we've read. Have I shown favoritism? Have you shown favoritism in the faith community when we shouldn't have? Have we? Have we shown favoritism in the faith community when we shouldn't have? Number two, when will I take, when will you take responsibility for my own actions and stop blaming S.A. Tan, stop blaming Yahweh, stop blaming others when I give or you give into temptation? It's so easy to say, well, S.A. Tan, you know, he's attacking me. And that, I mean, how many of you have heard that? When really, you just needed to take responsibility for your actions 
and repent and humble yourself. And then goodness comes. It's so easy to blame Satan. It's so easy to blame demons. It's so easy to say, oh, Yahweh is, you know, and we can get all highbrow spiritual. But the reality is it is that we need to take responsibility for our own actions when we give in to temptation. And number three, am I a rich person who's become so corrupted by society that I've rationalized away my responsibility to the poor? And number four, when was the last time that I confessed my sins to others publicly and allowed myself to be held accountable? These are things that we have to ask because this is what the text is trying to communicate to us because it's trying to make us more cohesive as a body of believers so that we can face what's coming in these yom last days. You see, the trouble with the book of Yaakov is for too many years, too many teachers have turned its pages just to strip mine it. How many? Oh, there's a nice nugget for a sermon. And they've just used the book of James to strip mine it for spiritual nuggets to fill their sermons. But that's not what this is about. That's not what this is about. They've invalidated the context. They've invalidated the culture. And they've lost the communication of the homily of what its purpose was. And I pray that our time through this text over these last weeks, this journey through James, delivered a deluge for us of discipleship, answerability, into our arena that we're now walking out with Yahweh, and that now it will affect our avenues of influence, that we can speak into people's lives and we can all be better because of it. Because it's deeply impacted me. It truly has especially Yaakov chapter 4. Because this is a text about how we walk together as believers today, now, so that we can have the future with Yahuwah that we all dream and desire of, because it's coming. But we have to take responsibility for our actions today so that we can gain the spiritual blessings in the future. Does that make sense? There's a lot to think about in this message, a lot to think about in chapter 5, but truly a, a blessing, Yaakov. Any questions, comments, anyone? Uh, I've been watching you teach for about two years now, and I've never seen you walk up with a T-shirt with any type of statement on it, so would you mind explaining the shirt? My, yes, well, I was feeling kind of, you know, Americana, patriotic, you know, it's July 4th, and, you know, I've really, I just, I've, I've read about 2,000 pages over the past year on um, the First Nations people. And I thought, yeah, I, I, can, I'm, I can go with this one. This is, you know, I, I felt like it, yeah. Yeah, Tamara said it's a bit rock and roll, isn't it? That's the reason, yeah. I was feeling kind of patriotic. Was that a legitimate question or your question? That was my question. Oh, that was your question, okay. I can get you one, too. <laughs> that's Sitting Bull. That's Geronimo. And this is, I'm not sure, this is one of the Fighting Braves. Not sure. Does anyone know who that is? Definitely Sitting Bull, though. Definitely Geronimo. Not sure on that fella. Right there. Okay. Yes. Um, Stop it. What verse in Genesis did come who in? Who is it? Cochise? Nice, Cochise. Nice. All right, Cochise, Sitting Bull, Geronimo. Now we've got it. See, in the multitude of counselors. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. no, that's fine. Um, what verse in Genesis did coming in James five, seven, and eight go back to or refer to? I think it was fifteen two. Was it fifteen two? Genesis fifteen two. Oh, now you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> was it? Was it? Where was it? Oh, somebody's... Yes, 15.8. Thank you. Okay. 15.8 was the Kurios, the Kurios. Okay. The Master Yahuwah, or the Kurios Yahuwah, attached us. The Torah of first mention was the covenant between the pieces. 
Bereshit 15.8. Excellent. One more question. Um, uh, this is from Yaw's daughter. Is that a public confession that could be dangerous, of course, or is this amongst very close, loyal followers of Yah? How should you... Oh, follow? yeah, it's within the assembly of the saints. You don't want to be, like, going down to this Capitol building, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 this is, you know, where two or more are gathered, so there am I. It's to get it off of you so that you can be held accountable. Um, but um, it's something definitely within the community of faith, the believers, because there's a trust. You're a vulnerability. You now need to be with your trusted, believing body. All right, let's close in prayer. Baruch Hashem Yahuwah. Abba, we thank you so much, Abba, for your sovereignty, Abba, that you do lead and guide us in all things, Abba. And as we do live in these last days... We do know the fearful approach of Yahusha and Abba Yahuwah, the Yom Yahuwah is upon us. Abba, we pray that as these days approach, that we have preparation in our levim, our hearts, Abba, in our minds. And Abba, by your Ruach Kakodesh, your set-apart spirit, Abba, we know that we will have the confidence to walk forth your word and manifest your brightness and glory to the nations. Abba, we pray that Abba, as we have studied, and we have sought you in prayer, and have we have sought you in worship, the Abba, that now you will fill what is remaining, Abba, so that we can go forth and produce a bountiful harvest for this kingdom, the Abba is your people, in Yahushua's mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right. We have... To